India Legal Stories That Count. Hello and welcome to another special readout from India Legal magazine. As you know, we are the nation's first political legal independent weekly focusing on controversial issues of national and international importance. The video readouts we present to you regularly are the editorial team's choice of the most significant stories we believe should receive close scrutiny and wide circulation. You can watch them along with the visuals or listen to them as you would a podcast. Now, in this week's readout, we focus on what is an obvious subject for India Legal, the choice of U. U. Lalit as India's next Chief Justice. He succeeds Justice N.B. Ramanna in a smooth and orderly transition devoid of any political skullduggery, which has not been unknown in the past. The venerable Ramanna, who showed both uh, guts and grit, will be a tough act to follow. Even tougher because under the rules of retirement, Lalit will hold his position only for just short of uh, three months, about 78 or 79 days, uh, before he is succeeded by Justice Chandrachud, an original firebrand thinker. Justice Lalit is probably aware of the challenges he faces in his brief regime, and he has already spelled some of them out in a well-publicized newspaper interview. India Legal assigned Sup uh, Supreme Court advocate Lokendra Malik to make an independent assessment of the next CJI. Malik is an author, public speaker, and one of the most prolific writers for our magazine. In this readout of Malik's analysis, I bring to our viewers and listeners Malik's take on the process, the procedures, and the conventions behind the appointment of India's Chief Justices. These are usually not known to the public, which is under the impression that the succession is just automatic or at the whims of the government in power. Not so. Under the existing rules, uh, the recommendation by the outgoing Chief Justice of India, CJI, will be forwarded to the Prime Minister, who will then advise the President of India, the appointing authority of the Supreme Court judges, the President, to appoint Justice uh, UU Lalit to the Office of Chief Justice of India. This has already happened. Justice Lalit will have a short tenure of just, to be exact, 74 days as the CJI. Several constitutional pundits, lawyers, and social thinkers believe that the CJI should have a reasonably long tenure, at least a longer tenure, um, as, as in, the, in, the, in the states where judges actually uh, sit on the bench for life and that the Indian central government should increase the retirement age, at least, of the Supreme Court and High Court judges, so there is more continuity and perhaps even greater freedom. But the government has so far given no indication that it's considering any such suggestion. The office of the CJI holds a very important position in our constitutional structure. The CJI is the administrative head of the Supreme Court and the master of the roster. In other words, he is the person who chooses benches, as assigns what case should be handled by what bench, and whether a constitutional bench should look at a certain case of a national constitutional importance. He constitutes the benches, and of course he uh, uh, allocates the judges for adjudication, but he is also the head of the Supreme Court Collegium, which selects the judges of the Supreme Court and the High Courts. The recommendations made by the Supreme Court Collegium are binding on the President who generally acts on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. This is the parliamentary Westminster form of government, uh, headed by a Prime Minister. However, in the making uh, of judicial appointments, the President is not bound by the advice of the Cabinet and acts as per the recommendations of the Collegium headed by the CJI. Ideally, this is what happens. On the judicial side, the CJI is first among the equals and heads a bench that decides cases of different natures. The CJI is also co uh, the, the uh, considered leader 
of the judicial branch of the state. Ever since the establishment of the Supreme Court, the central government appoints the CJI based on the seniority convention, the senior most judge. However, this convention was breached in uh, two times, uh, often quoted, but worth repeating, because this history should be known to all uh, followers of India's uh, legal jurisprudence. This, uh, this happened in 1973 and in 1977, when senior judges were bypassed and pliable junior judges, pliable, were appointed uh, to the office of the CGI by the Indira Gandhi government, which practiced and promoted the culture of, unfortunately, a committed judiciary, which means a judiciary committed to helping out the government in power. Uh, this does happen in the United States, where the, 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 the president pretty much picks a, a, a judge of the Supreme Court um, who is a, a political follower or thinks politically uh, like um, uh, the president and the president's party, but not in India. But in 73, 1973, the Indira Gandhi government had bypassed three senior judges, namely Justices Shilat Grover and Hegde, and appointed um, uh, Justice A. N. Ray, who had a reputation of being a committed judge. Now, I use the word committed in, 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 in terms of a commitment to a certain political leader or a certain political party, and not necessarily a commitment to the rule of law. Uh, so he chose a committed judge as a CJI, as I said earlier. He hardly decided any cases against the government. In fact, the constitutional pundits believe that the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was unhappy with the three senior judges because of their several judgments against the government, including the famous Keswanand Bharati case, which had imposed several limitations on the lawmaking power of parliament and constitution um, amendment processes prescribed under Article 368 of the Constitution. In brief, con the Keshwaran Bharati case is, uh, the, um, lays the fundamental uh, uh, premise uh, that there are certain elements of the Constitution given to the people of India, by the people of India, that no um, institutional authority uh, can tinker with. That's Article 21, uh, fundamental rights, the right to equality, the right to liberty, and the right to life. These are considered the basic structure of the Constitution. And even the legislature, the elected legislature, according to Keshwan and Bharti, cannot <coughs> tinker with this and cannot overturn this. Now, a second time, the government bypassed Justice H.R. Khanna in 1977, because of his dissenting judgment delivered in the ADM Jabalpur case. Now, <clears throat> this case, and I'll repeat it, was something that said uh, that uh, during the emergency or given the emergency powers that Mrs. Gandhi had exercised, even the right to liberty and even life uh, uh, could be interfered with. And uh, she appointed Justice M.H. Beg to the office of CJI. Now, like Justice Ray, Justice Beg was also considered a darling of the government because of his pro-government approach. Fortunately, after 1977, no judicial supersession took place in the country and the central government followed the seniority convention strictly in appointing the CJI. However, some Janta Party leaders had demanded that the supersession of Justice Y.V. Chandrachud because of his judgment in the ADM uh, Jabalpur case. Now, this is Justice Y.B. Uh, Chandrachud, who is the father of Justice Chandrachud, who is now on the, the Supreme Court and will succeed uh, Justice Lalit. Anyway, to go back to the same story, uh, the uh, Union Law Minister Shanti Bhushan and Prime Minister Moraji Desai did not agree with their party uh, um, and, and declared the, and actually cleared the way for Justice Chandrachud to the office of the CJI. Now, in his memoirs entitled Courting Destiny, Shanti Bhushan recalls uh, that, uh, that episode in these words. And I quote him, it's very interesting uh, uh, to, 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 to read this. Uh, well, uh, well, listen to this as, as you will do now. I quote, 
Justice Baig was due to retire on 20th February 1978 and the government had to reconsider whom to appoint in his place. After the furor raised when A. N. Ray was appointed as Chief Justice by, the superseding, by, by superseding three senior judges in the Supreme Court, a consensus had emerged that the government should not have the right to select the Chief Justice since it was likely to affect the independence of the judiciary. Instead, whoever was the senior-most judge at, a time, at the time, a vacancy arose, uh, should be appointed. The senior most judge after Justice Baig was Justice Chandrachud. However, since Justice Chandrachud and Justice Bhagwati had been party to the infamous decision of the Supreme Court in the case of ADM Jamalpur, in which they had laid down that there was no right to life or liberty during an emergency, there was a very strong public opinion in the country against the elevation of Justice Chandrachud. Since the appointment of judges uh, pertained to my ministry, now this is uh, Shanti Bhushan talking in his memoirs, I'm continuing the quote, I received a personal letter on this subject from Jay Prakash Narayan. JP was of course the leader of the movement that formed the Janta Party and uh, JP uh, was uh, like a, a father figure uh, to the anti-emergency, anti-Indra Gandhi, anti-Congress movement that had brought the Janta government into power. Now, Narayan was then in Jaslok Hospital, Bombay. He was suffering from a, a kidney ailment. He wrote to me, uh, writes uh, Bhushan, that as Justice Chandrachud had let, do uh, let down the whole nation during the emergency by being a party to the infamous decision, the infamous decision in uh, such a vital question as to the right and, uh, to, to life and liberty, he was of the view that the judge should not be elevated to the position of the Chief Justice of India. I had immense respect for Jay Prakash Narayan. I replied immediately that since the subject was very sensitive and the decision had many dimensions to it, I would like to come to Bombay and discuss the issue personally with him. So I went to Bombay, met JP in the hospital and had a lengthy discussion with him on this issue. I was strongly of the view that there were two reasons why we must not fail to uh, the, uh, the, the fall to the temptation of appointing a Chief Justice by superseding judges. One, having very strongly advocated the principle of elevation to the office of Chief Justice only by seniority, we should not be seen as violating that principle. Two, even if we appointed a person from the outside, the Supreme Court at least, some sections of the public would, sections of the public would see it as the Janta Party government handpicking a person for the highest judicial office. This fact in itself would undermine the moral authority of the Chief Justice and whenever he had to take a position on a controversial matter, particularly a politically sensitive matter, someone would point a finger to it um, if it happened to be in favor of the government. On the whole, I strongly believed that however distasteful it might be for us to appoint Justice Chandrachud, we had to adhere to the principle for which we had campaigned five years ago. I am happy to say that Jay Prakash Narayan saw the validity of my opinion. He agreed that the government should stick to the principle of seniority. Having brought him around to my views, I had still to deal with the Janta Party MPs. Most of them had suffered. Uh, when they had been jailed for up to um, 19 months uh, or so on account of the judgment given in the ADM Jabalpur case. I sent a note to Prime Minister Muraji Desai recommending the elevation of Justice Chandrachud by drawing his attention to the almost total judicial consensus in the country that the principle of seniority should be followed. Prime Minister unhesitatingly accepted my advice and Justice Chandrachud was appointed as Chief Justice of India. Since by this time the views of Jayaprakash Narayan were known to the press, no dissenting voices were raised in Parliament. This is the uh, full quote from, I think it starts on page 188 of Shanti Bhushan's memoirs. Now, since 1977, the seniority convention has been followed constantly without any breach in the appointment of the CGI. The Law Commission, headed by Justice H.R. Khanna, 
had also recommended to the central government to follow the seniority convention while appointing the CJI in 1993. The Supreme Court also approved the seniority convention in the appointment of the CJI. Uh, this is what the court observed regarding this issue, and I quote the court. Apart from the two well-known departures, appointments to the office of the Chief Justice of India have by convention been the senior most judges of the Supreme Court considered fit to hold office and the proposal is initiated in advance by the outgoing Chief Justice of India. The provision in Article 124, bracket 2, enabling consultation with any other judge is to provide for such consultation if there be any doubt about the fitness of the senior most judge to hold the office, which alone may permit and justify a departure from the long-standing convention. For this reason, no other substantive consultative process is involved. There is no reason to depart from the existing convention and therefore, any further norm for the working of Article 124, brackets 2, in the appointment of Chief Justice of India is unnecessary. Malik observes that uh, given the above, it is obvious that the seniority convention is a safe method to save the judicial branch from executive interference. If the government gets the space to breach the convention, there would be disastrous consequences and the independence of the judiciary would be compromised. We need a strong judiciary which can protect the people's rights from the executive excesses and encroachments. The CJI is a very powerful constitutional authority who plays a significant role in protecting the rule of law, uh, uh, constitutionalism and judicial independence and only a strong leader can defend this institution. Justice Lalit, by all counts, is a great defender of judicial independence. He was elevated to the Supreme Court bench directly in August 2014 during the tenure of then CJI R. M. Loda. After Justice S. M. Sikri, he will be the second CJI who has directly come from the bar. His short tenure means that unfortunately he will face the restrictions of time. In this essay, we focused on the procedures and processes, the political and historical imperatives that are involved in the appointment of the Chief Justice. Now, in the next episode, related to this, in the next episode, I will focus on the specific jurisprudential issues that Justice Lalit has grappled with as a judge, his overall performance, including the challenges that lie ahead. Uh, the analysis will be researched and written by G. V. Rao, another Supreme Court advocate and a frequent contributor to India Legal. If you enjoyed this readout, do join me again for the next one, coming soon. This is your host editor, Indrajit Badwar. Until next time, goodbye for now. India Legal, stories that count.